Well, today we continue our sermon series, We Are, and the last couple weeks we've been discovering more and more of who we are as a body of believers, as people who of Christ, who we are in Christ, and how that affects us today. The first week we learned that we are disciples, that in Christ we have a life that is wider, deeper, and fuller than anything that we have on our own. So a disciple, it makes sense as disciples that we are students of life and that we experience more and more of that life and go deeper and deeper into it. And then last week we discovered that we are also generous and that generosity is not just something that's commanded of us, rather it is a response to the gospel. That generosity flows solely from that. And it's only when we understand the power of the gospel and what Christ has done for us that we are going to be a generous people in return. And that involves our tithes and offerings, but it involves so much of who we are just in life in general. And so today, we're going to learn that we are united. Now, this is a message on unity, and that seems kind of a strange time for this message to be given, considering all that is happening in our denomination, right? And especially recently hearing that one of the proposals is about splitting the denomination in two. So it's probably going to be very easy for you to think about that during my sermon this morning. And, and yes, some of it will be directed towards that, but to know this morning that my sermon, the unity that I'm talking about, is not about institutional or denominational unity. Because even if we as Methodists somehow got it all together and remained unified, we still have the problem of the fact that we are divided against all the other Christian denominations, right? So we don't get along that well with them either. So so what is unity? We're going to be talking about that today, and I think it's also the perfect opportunity to do so, considering that this weekend with Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Day tomorrow, and um, his poignant reflection that on Sunday morning, that worship hour is the most segregated hour of worship. And that was true then, and I, I imagine that in many ways it still is today. And so we have a lot to come over or, or, or to get over as we continue to work towards unity. Now today's message on unity is important if we are going to understand who we are in Christ. And so today's passage for us, which comes from Romans chapter 14, um, believe it or not, conflict is not a new thing in the life of the church. And it's always been going on. And so, so we're going to find a passage today that Paul is dealing with a very real and, and difficult problem in the life of the early church, and, and he is going to attack that head on. I know for most of us, we have this picture of the early church that the first 100 years were just like perfect, and everybody got along, people were singing kumbaya, and like it was just growing rapidly and everything, but it's not. And we're going to discover that today in Romans chapter 14, what that conflict was and how that speaks to us today about this message of unity and how we can discover that in Christ we are united. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn with me to Romans chapter 14. If not, you can do the easy thing and just look at the screen this morning. So this is what Paul writes. He says, let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that brother or sister stumble. The faith that you have 
have as your own conviction before God. Blessed are those who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat, because they do not act from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are thankful for your word and that it is open to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, may the words of these uh, pages in this passage, may they be sown into our hearts and transform us from the inside out that we might become your people as you designed us to be, that is, in community with one another. And so, Lord, may we receive this message today, not as words that come from my mouth, but words that come to us from Holy Scripture, the Word of God that is living and active in our midst. So, Lord, we thank you for these words as we pray in your Son's holy name. Amen. So before we get too much into what unity is about and, and why it's important for us, we have to determine this morning why you're here. I don't mean to, like you just physically showed up this morning, but why you are a part of the church. Why is it necessary for you to be here? We can't talk about unity unless we establish why it's important for you to be a part of the church. Because otherwise you're going to hear this message of unity and you're going to be like, well, I don't really need the church anyways. I don't need to show up on Sunday mornings. I don't need these other people. So why do I need to listen to a message on unity? So it's really clear that we, it's necessary for us to establish why we're here. Now, many of us know the benefits of being a community, right? They're, it's nice to have a community of people around you to support you, especially in times of need, through prayer, um, through food, whatever it is. That's, that's one of the benefits of it. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the belief. So yes, there are a lot of benefits to being in a community with one another, and it's a joy and strength to gather together. But what is the exact reason why we show up here on a Sunday morning, why we're a part of a church? Why do we do this thing? This is one of the questions that I get from people a lot. Like when I'm out and uh, people ask what I do, um, I hesitate telling them because often people will be like, oh, I used to go to church or go into this weird, awkward confession time where they're con like, it's like turned into a confessional and I have to remind them I'm not a priest, you know, I can't absolve them of their sins or anything. I've gotten to the point where I just tell people I sell life insurance and that's <laughs> it's technically true, right? <laughs> In a way. But, but this is one of the one complaint that I get. I, I hear story after story of people saying, you know, I went to the church, and man, they're messed up people. And they were judgmental, and it was divided, and, and it was ugly, and, and I just left, and I'm going to do my own thing now. Because it's not necessary uh, to go to church in order to be a Christian. And people ask me that, you know, is it necessary to go to church uh, to be a uh, Christian. And, and I say, no, it's, it's not. Going to church does not make you a Christian. But I will say that as a Christian, you will go to church. And not just because of some law or requirement or because you have to. It's because that's who you were made to be. You were made to be a part of a body of people. Anytime that, that Scripture mentions our relationship to Christ. It's always in the context of a community of people around us. One of my favorite metaphors or images that Paul gives, and it's the most apt metaphor for understanding the church, is that we are the body of Christ. He gives this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that we are a body of Christ and that Christ is the head. And for us to remain attached to Christ, we have to be a part of the body. No one part of the body can say, I can go off and be by myself and do my own thing and have a relationship to the head because it's as a body that we are connected to Christ. So no, this morning, the reason for church is not for salvation. You don't show up just for salvation. That doesn't offer you that. It's not for attendance, but it's for the life which Jesus offers us. And it's a life together that we have as people. And it's important for us to understand this if we're going to understand the power of unity. Because we were made to be together, 
It makes sense for us to understand what unity is and how it's a gift and how we can use it. Because believe me, the moment that we join a community, there's going to be conflict, right? In fact, people don't realize this, but many of the books of the New Testament would not be in our Bibles if it wasn't for conflict. Paul addressed many of his letters to a community, and the whole reason he wrote the letter is because they were in conflict with each other. So the moment that we mention community, it's almost like we have to get into that other C word of conflict right away because it's a natural result. It happens when we're in community with one another. Conflict happens, and how we deal with that conflict says a lot. And so that's where we come upon Romans chapter 14 this morning. I'm going to read that first verse that comes to us in verse 13 again from our passage today. And then I'm going to explain a little bit of what's going on here. So Paul writes this. He says, Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. See, what's happening here? in this community, a community that Paul has never met, is you have two groups of people. It's always two groups of people, right? Two groups of people, they're in conflict. And Paul calls them the strong and the weak. He uses those designations. And I know that's hard for us to understand today because we, for us, those are some loaded terms. Like, of course, you want to be the strong. You don't want to be the weak, even though often weakness is is heralded and, and commended in Scripture. But one designation that I really like is one that my um, professor used when I was in seminary. She called the two groups, uh, the one group, the strong, she called them the garbage bellies, and then the other group, the weak, she called them the lettuce eaters. So we're going to call them the garbage bellies and the lettuce eaters because there's this dispute that's happening in the community over food, and it's not what was brought to the potluck. It's about food that is sacrificed in temples to pagan gods. So on the one hand, you have one group of people, the garbage bellies, who say, you know what, we have freedom in Christ. There is only one true God, and meat is meat, so it doesn't matter what you eat. That didn't mean to rhyme there. But it doesn't matter. We can do what we want. There's great freedom in Christ. So they're called the garbage bellies. They'll eat anything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect their relationship to Christ or their faith in God. It's perfectly fine for them to eat that meat. On the other hand, you have the other group, the lettuce eaters, who are so concerned with this idea of food that is sacrificed to idols because they believe that if if you were to eat that, it's like you're participating in another religion. And and by doing that, you're betraying your faith in Christ. So they're so concerned with that that they won't eat meat at all because they don't know if it was sacrificed in a temple or not. So they just avoid it all together. They're vegetarians as a result. And so you have these two groups. And I know for us today, we hear this conflict and we're like, what is the problem with these people? It's just food. But they're dividing against one another because each side believes that their position is of eternal consequence and that if people don't get on board with their view, then they're no longer Christian. They're no longer a part of the community. So the garbage bellies are like, you have freedom. I'm going to eat what I want, and I'm going to eat it in front of you. (laughs) And you're going to have to deal with it. And then you have the lettuce eaters who say, no, you can't eat that at all. If you want to be a Christian, you have to give up meat, which would be a terrible way to enter Christianity, wouldn't it? And so you have these two groups, and Paul has an interesting take on this. This is what he says in verse 14. He says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. So Paul comes right out and he says, you know what? In my heart of hearts, I'm persuaded that the garbage bellies are theologically correct. But the next line says, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. So Paul's not getting into this debate about beliefs here. His take is really interesting. He's saying, I agree with the garbage bellies, but I also understand that for the lettuce eaters, that eating that would be unclean for them. And so basically he agrees with both people because for him, it's not the beliefs on the matter that matter the most to him. It's their behavior towards one another. It's the fact that they're living in judgment 
with one another. That's what verse 13 was about, remember? Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another. And so that's the reason why he gives that. And so he goes on in verses 15 through 16 to provide a different way forward for them. He says, if your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, he's speaking to the, the garbage bellies here, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. Ouch, right? That a simple act here of eating meat would cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. That's what Paul is saying is at stake. So do not let your good be spoken of as evil. As I see it, Paul is presenting basically two paths to the Romans, and he's presenting two paths to us today. We can carry down, we can carry along the path that uh, the Romans were already headed down in terms of, you know what, I'm going to do my thing, and I'm going to believe and hold on to the fact that I can eat meat no matter what, and lettuce eaters, I'm going to keep making sure that those people over there feel guilty for what they're doing, that they're not truly Christian. We could head down that path, and we could let the good be spoken of as evil. That path of conflict is a way of blaspheming the good, the good news of what Jesus has done on the cross, that by choosing to go down that path, they are choosing to let the good be spoken of as evil. Or we could do go down the path of love. He says that we are to walk in love. Now, when we talk about love, we're, it's really easy for us to mention the word love, but it's really hard for us to define exactly what that looks like. And Paul helps us out a little bit. He says this in verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He explains that when you are walking in love, this is the path that you're taking. You're taking the path of the kingdom of God, which consists of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That each one of those. Now, when we hear righteousness, we often think of our moral behavior, but righteousness in Scripture refers to God's action in the world to make things right. And so righteousness, we don't have any righteousness on our own. It's what God is doing. It's God's righteousness in our life, at work in our lives. If we are to walk in love, Paul is saying, we need God's righteousness at work in our hearts, in our minds, in the way that we treat one another. Paul says that at the beginning of his letter to the Romans. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of salvation for all people. For in it, the righteousness of God is being revealed. The righteousness of God is being revealed in us and through us as God works in us. So walking in love requires righteousness. But I've also discovered that, you know what? Walking in love also leads to peace. That's where the road leads us. That peace is a natural result of living in love and sharing that love with other people. But most importantly, walking in love consists of joy. And that's because I can't think of a joyless love. There's no such thing as a joyless love. When you experience love, true love, it brings joy and fills your heart. This is what Karl Barth had to say. And I'm sorry, I quote German theologians all the time. In fact, I quote him more than John Wesley, so don't tell the bishop that I quote German Lutheran pastors and theologians more than our own John Wesley. But this is what he said about joy. He said, joy is really the simplest form of gratitude. This is where that generosity sermon from last week and, and the united part joined together is that if we experience this great grace of God that, that we live with gratitude and joy is a natural result. This is the path that Paul enjoins us to go down, that we would walk in love. And it's important that we understand this, because I'm here to tell you that there will always, always, always be differences in the church. Always. And it's built into it. I mean, by design, God created a church where there are people with different gifts. 
Thank God, right? We all have different gifts. Now, sometimes those gifts cause a little bit of friction and conflict because people want one person's gift, even though they don't have it and they want it. I've never once had somebody uh, envious of, of, of the gift of preaching because it's hard to get them to come up here and preach on a Sunday morning. But we all have different gifts and we use those gifts in the context of the community. So difference is already built in. But also, you're always going to find in a community differences in belief. That's a thing. And it, it causes conflict, I know. People do that. One way that we've tried to organize things or try to get people to, to get together and at least move forward with one another is this statement. Have you heard this before? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Now, it's a good statement, but it still has some problems with it. I mean, it's pretty hard for us to do, agree what's essential, right? Like what may be essential for me may not be essential for you. And so that's the whole reason that we're divided and the whole non-essentials thing, liberty. Like really, we just had Paul saying that do not use your freedom to cause the ruin of somebody else. Yes, you have. This is a non-essential thing called food and drink, but still don't use your liberty to ruin or harm the life of other person. And really the best thing about this statement and the reason why I share it with you this morning is that last line, in all things charity. That's perhaps the only thing that we can agree on out of this statement and everything is that in all things, Paul enjoins us to love one another. Despite the differences in our gifts, our differences in our beliefs, whether they're essential, non-essential, in all things, charity. And the reason why this is important is that we're not just talking about love in general. We're talking about the love that was displayed for us and demonstrated for us in Christ Jesus that on the cross, we have the perfect definition of love. And so if we are going to live as a community, there is no way for us to live as a community without the cross at the center of who we are. We're not going to organize ourselves. We're not going to be able to get together, even our best minds together, and, and come up with a solution where everybody will have unity as a result because it's not something that we can achieve. It's something that only God can do for us. If we achieve unity without Jesus Christ, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? There's no way to have unity or community without the cross being there. And that's what Paul is trying to remind the people in this passage constantly. He goes on in Romans 15. He says this. He says, We who are strong, the garbage bellers, bellies, ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope this morning. It's not about, fr uh, it's not about friends, um, just emulating what Christ did in his sac self-sacrificial love. It's about understanding that it's truly by the power of the cross that we can live together in unity. And so when you're experiencing difficulty with somebody, when you're at loggerheads with them, and it feels like there is an impasse, there's this wall between you, and that you will never, ever come to terms with each other, look to the cross. When it seems like everything is a confusing mess, and you don't know which way is up and down because everybody is at each other's throats, look to the cross. When things in the denomination are falling apart and, and you don't know what's going on, look to the cross. When things in the world are falling apart, look to the cross. Because the only thing that keeps us together is the one thing that makes the whole world live. And that's the cross. See, friends, how terrible is it that we as Christians would take the cross and not just ignore its message, but use it as a weapon of judgment against one another. When in fact, we have to realize 
that the cross was originally used as a weapon of judgment against Christ and that now in Christ there is no condemnation and that he took on that judgment himself. And so it is not up to us to wield weapons of judgment against one another, but it is to remind ourselves that the cross is God's act of giving us life and we have a responsibility to live life around it. So friends, unity is not something that we achieve. And I know we try to do it, right? We've tried. But it's a gift, something that God gives us in Jesus Christ. This is what uh, Paul goes on to say in the next couple verses of Romans 15. He says, May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another. Notice it says there, grant you. He's given you this opportunity to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, I don't know where you are this morning what your state of mind is, what disagreements you have within your family, let alone within a community of believers. But know this morning that unity is a gift that comes to us through Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross. And because of that gift, we have the opportunity to live in that unity together. And so I'm going to read this passage again, and this is the last time I'm going to read it, but this time I want you to hear it as if Paul is directly addressing you. This is what he says to you this morning. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you, Oxford United Methodist Church, to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we have two paths. The path of walking in love and the path of judgment and condemnation. The cross teaches us to go in the path of love. May we follow the God of steadfastness and encouragement as we walk together in love. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord God, we are thankful that you loved us so much that you sent your son into the world that through him and his death, and his resurrection, we might experience that wider, deeper, fuller life that we can only discover in you. Lord, teach us that with that gift of life is the gift of unity. And with that gift, we are called as your servants. So Lord, teach us to walk in love with one another, that when conflict arises, we look not to ourselves, but we look to the cross. For it is in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Friends, as we walk together in love, may you be reminded that the cross is not a weapon we wield in judgment, but it is a message of hope and reconciliation and justice. It's God's way of bringing us together and turning us from the inside out that we might be together people who share love with one another. So may you go today walking in love and sharing that love with one another. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.